Appamada's programmes and facilities are supported through your generosity. Your support really does make a huge difference. You'll find a link for contributions on the website at appamada.org forward slash contribute. Thank you so much. So, welcome back. We're going to continue to unfold <clears throat> this uh, exploration of vow. And uh, we're going to ask that you, um, you do some work on your own and we met in here some little bits and we're building a little smaller, small groups here. So we're going to have you meeting groups of four with, uh, there's no preparation that is required other than your whole life. Cool. Uh, <laughs> you had into this group before. <clears throat> and this is what we're going to ask you to reflect on and then speak about with each other. <clears throat> Think of a time, a moment, a relationship, something in your life. It doesn't have to be a big thing at all. It could be a very small thing. But you could tell at that moment, you know the phrase that we have been using often, um, the Dogen phrase about pulled by karma or led by vow. In that moment or in that situation, you notice that you were operating from a place that was clearer or deeper or by vow, not by personal preference. And what surprised you about that? Um, you know, what, what did you notice about the quality of that particular situation? It was interesting to you. What was nourishing was challenging, especially if you're not operating out of habit. Uh, so that you begin to explore, you first to acknowledge that you have such experiences, you can name them and make them an embodied reality, uh, and that you can share them with other, other people and listen to others too, because it's encouraging to do so. But you're also exploring what this, this sort of shift of being led by now and simply pulled around by karma is like in your, in your life and in the life of those with you. So once again, it doesn't have to be some dramatic thing. It can be a, a small thing in a, a relationship or something that you're doing. Is that? But also, if you noticed any consequences of that, either internally or externally, what were the effects? Any questions about what we're asking you to do? And it's not. Um, it's not about writing about that. It's just an opportunity in your group of four to speak about that, whatever that experience might have been. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'll prompt you with to begin with is we'll take, um, where do we go? Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll go about half an hour to give you plenty of time. Um, also, notice the impact on you of both speaking to your friends and ha and listening to them in the group itself. <clears throat> Not just what happened that you're reflecting on, but as you bring it into the moment, what starts to happen? You speak about it. Uh, what's uh, called up, what's called for in the situation, and speak about that too. Be generous to each other, give time for each other, listen in loving presence, and uh, okay. So if they have half an hour, uh -huh. and they sit for a couple of minutes first to sort of settle, mm -hmm. um, and they keep track of their own time, um, how much time do you think each person should have? Well, I mean, that would be around at least five minutes each. Yeah. But you don't have to use five minutes. But I mean, that gives you kind of a ballpark. And then if you, mm -hmm. if you finish before then, it's a chance to just sort of discuss that, what you heard. Uh, we have confidence in you to use your time well. Yeah, uh, but that is a, a little ballpark. But just to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to share in that time and space. And during that five minutes, is it interactive or do the others just listen? They just listen. It's kind of a good idea in the beginning just to listen because some it goes a little differently. Yeah. If you're just and if someone goes silent during that time, just hold them in the silence. Yeah. That's totally fine. Yeah. It's not a problem or 
evening and just see how it goes and then be warm and listening and like you would want them to be for you. And then each person can speak and then you can all then open it up. Makes it a nice flow. You've heard in the um, writing that I've been sharing with you, the significance of specific details that give the flavor of the situation. Mm -hmm. So whatever you can recall that gives the specific details that provide a sense of the situation and mm -hmm. what your place in it is um, will be helpful. Mm -hmm. So online, um, if you will make uh, groups of four or thereabouts, it may not work out perfectly, but that would be great, okay? And half an hour. Any reports from the front? Well, first of all, anyone not able to recall any time <laughs> in their past like that? No, okay, all right. All right, reports from the front. It's curious. It's we didn't get to be in the groups. What was interesting, surprising, perplexing, inspiring, anything? Well, I would just say that we all recognize how much our practice had impacted our lives. And we, we had specific examples, but then there were other things that just couldn't, that was so clear. So there's some uh, uh, recognition and gratitude that we put together. And I think, I, I was in Joan's group, and, and I think for me, what became real apparent in listening to everyone and, and relaying my own um, story was that noticing that when that clarity happened, when you noticed what was going on, it's like everything just, there was this relief because you didn't have to fix it. You didn't, you know, you were just present with it and you noticed what was going on and, and everything became very clear about what the next step was. But there's just, there was no tension. You know, that's, that's one level when, when you read, when Dogen says body and mind drop away. Mm -hmm. I know there are greater versions of it, but it's like, oh yeah, this is yeah, part is of what's happening. This yeah. isn't something exalted. This is something that happens yeah. this way. And it happens on its own. Mm -hmm. That image that probably I've shared before that someone was talking to me when we were in Japan about, there was so much giant bamboo, these forests around the place we were in, it's really beautiful. And when it snows, it gets really heavy. And he weighs it down, mm -hmm. you know, like when the ice came here. But the, the giant bamboo, when he gets to a certain place, it slides off and it just comes right back up. Oh. On its own. Oh. When it releases the burden. Mm -hmm. And then that was that really helped me. Yeah. That image is really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. Or like um, a Tibetan teacher, um, when I was actually at Naropa one time, and he, he was saying, he said, Oh, easy. <laughs> he said, it's like if you have a bale of hay. And you cut the, so the cord is holding it, it just falls open. You don't have to do anything, it just falls apart, opens up once you cut the fetters, you know, that are sort of making it. You don't have to. <laughs> Can I add another metaphor? Um, George Saunders says that it's like after he's been meditating, he can just like catch the frisbee. Like, it, <laughs> <laughs> something really casual. Like life is just throwing frisbees at you all the time, and then you can just walk along and catch them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hand up. Bridget? I'm muting myself. There you go. Well, the, the two things I conveyed were the fact that over time, I had never realized about the importance of taking a pause. And I first met you in 2013, Flint, when you were co-facilitating the Contemplative Leadership Workshop with Patty uh, uh -huh. Steiner. And you showed a video of that man playing the orchestra. And just before he, before he lowered his baton and stopped the music, you could see the connection between 
the, the conductor, the orchestra, and the audience and the music. And that, that ability to learn to use a pause effectively was the thing. And then when you did the TED talk, uh, the TEDx talk here, I listened to it and I made that little piece of paper and I, you had asked that may your greatest longing be met by your greatest gift. Yeah. And I wrote on there, my greatest gift was my love of music. And yet as a child, my mother had been told that she needn't bring me to the piano lessons anymore. But sure. after that, I actually purchased a classical guitar and started taking lessons. And so I opened up a whole new avenue to myself that I had ignored my whole life. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's, uh, it's always interesting to hear these reflections too, <laughs> things I would never know. Um, <laughs> That uh, echoes my aspiration, you know. Um, somebody in our group uh, was talking about how he had been uh, practicing with some part of himself. And, um, and, and then and speak, was, speak like you're speaking to them. OK. <laughs> he'd, been <laughs> he'd been practicing with some part of himself and then uh, had an opportunity to uh, like see see what he'd been practicing with in, in uh, somebody else, mm. and then was able to uh, be just totally present and and comforting in that moment. Mm. And I thought that was uh, I, I just I like that the, the, that you can use you can use your own struggles mm. uh, to uh, be helpful in the world. I thought that was a really Good, good story. What's well, actually an essential key in the teachings for this week in the intensive, the, the Bodhisattva about inside and outside. Yeah. You know, right. freeing someone here makes you more free out there. You use the connection you have out there to help free. The second, we get, oh, it's one heart, one mind, one body, not two. So that's a fantastic example. So. We all had. Um, different experiences, but they all kind of happen without us really trying to make them happen. Yeah. Um, we were sort of pushed or shoved or thrown in the in the general direction, um, and it was kind of like we didn't really have to think about it or um, go through the struggle of like yeah, trying to make the right decision. And I think we also all recognize that. This community and this practice um, helps bring that forward. Yeah, we set the conditions for our natural goodness to flourish because it wants to. It's beautiful. And <clears throat> I'll be speaking about that tomorrow morning in Grammar Talk too. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're talking about. So thank you. Okay, I'm unmuted. <laughs> So it's interesting, this exercise really helped me to understand the vow exercise we've been doing. I struggled a little bit yesterday with writing it down. When I had that time, I like did a lot of free form writing, but it just didn't feel like I was connecting to it. But this exercise made it really easy for me. So yet, I guess it was yesterday, I left, the Sangha saying, okay, I, I understand my vows. I understand it now. And it was like, I had this image of this clothesline with a, a little piece of clothing, a sheet, and all these different, very neatly placed items with the wooden clothespins on a clothesline. And each of them was my vow. And I thought, well, maybe tomorrow I can take off one piece of clothing and that will be one vow that I can try to live, right? And so when we did this exercise today, it was like, oh, I don't need a clothesline. I'm already doing it. So <laughs> it, took me, <laughs> it took me from up here and trying to write about it and say what my vow was to the point where you said, think of a time when you operated from vow. Mm -hmm. And it immediately clicked in my mind the experience and I was able to articulate it. So I just wanted to say thank you for that exercise because it got me out of my rigidity about vows. 
and you're demonstrating a constancy of practice. We try different things. Every once in a while, one of them lands. <laughs> but you have to hang out until that happens, you know? Yeah, thank you. I hope you're feeling better. I'm feeling a little bit better. Yeah, you can hear my voices a little bit, yeah. you know, like Barry White, but I feel much better. Yeah, you're more energetic. That's good. Yeah, thank you. Um, I loved when Susan said that one of her vows is coming every day here in the morning, and it's not something virtuous. And I was like, ooh, that's so great because I struggle with this vow making. I don't want to start seeing it as being something virtuous that I can feel really good about myself for. And, and so that's something I've been wanting to ask you guys about. Like if I start to think of myself as this upstanding vow person, that's kind of <laughs> risky. And, and so I got to watch that. And I'm wondering if y'all have any tips. <laughs> I, you've answered your question really well. <laughs> I, you know, if it helps, don't think about it as vow. Think about it as your intention. What's my intention here? Where does that intention come from? One of the ways <clears throat> to deepen that exact question, I'm just using different language. Think of internal family systems language is sometimes useful for this. We often turn turn the so Buddha nature, true self, whatever you want to call it, it's hard language. That natural flow that, that happens even just by itself spontaneously when we open to it. We so quickly, and especially in spiritual practice, turn them into manager practices. Mm -hmm. Something we're gonna do for a result. Mm -hmm. So you hear these things about no gaining ideas, kind of like what? And actually this means it's not a self trying to figure out some way to be good. It's, and so when you we talk about the Eightfold Path, being in accord with life, it's like, this isn't being good, it's just being freely alive. And it goes like this. Right. Yeah, it was, we kind of answered it a little bit because Ellen said it's just, a, it's a practice, it's a, something you do, it's not something you are exactly. And you can do exactly the same things on the outside, you're watching people do things and one person is gonna be virtuous and one not, just to make it binary, because it's not about what you do, but who's doing it. And also the perceptions and the um, expectations of others are irrelevant in that situation. Why we have that adage about when you're alone, practice like with others, when mm -hmm. others practice like you're alone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> hey, can you say more about the perception of others? To... Well, in the um, situations that you each talked about, was there a sense of um, that it was done for the approval of others, or so that others would see you in a certain way, or did it matter to you even? what others would think of what you were doing. We're not making them irrelevant, because that would be another man. No. It's like it doesn't occur, it's not, it's, it's, it's not, it's not it's part of the not, equation. It's not part of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it okay to bask in a little afterglow? <laughs> <laughs> that's, why, that's why I said notice if it's your Yeah, okay. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, a theme sort of related came up in our group, which is the other side of that. Like, does noticing it yourself matter so much? Like this self-awareness, like to have had a memory of it. I mean, like what's the difference between like Pamada and something like flow and moving with your life, just being so engaged that like you're not worried about vowing so much in the moment. Does that apply, you know, as you said, it doesn't, the perception of others, like why, well, does, why does the perception of self where does that fit? I think that self-awareness is important because you can be in the flow. It's just the flow of conditioning. And it feels comfortable and it feels easy. And it, well, that's why we practice. So that we can it's, it's a, it's, she's it. talking about like a tricky, like once again, I have like a self-like part. Yeah. It's coming from a part of you that feels like your real self, but really it's 
So like that, but, but that's that's self suspicion. How does that help? Yeah. Self suspicion. Well, yeah, yeah, like wondering if this this kind of flowing thing is somehow the dubious like self like part. Well, just asking questions is always interesting. I don't think it's, I don't think it's self suspicion, but a kind of ongoing inquiry. Where is this coming from? This activity. Where is it coming from? Just being awake. No. Critical or evaluating. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know when you read when Buddhists are truly Buddhists, they are not necessarily notice that they're Buddhists. Yeah, yeah they're actualized Buddhists who go on actualizing Buddhas. Yeah. It's like yeah, it's not that you're self-conscious. That doesn't mean you're not self-reflective or awake. Yeah. Good I, question. I think where um, one I can think of a situation I was in unfortunately recently where I completely thought that I was in the flow and believed entirely my little reality was the bigger reality. And it was by the impact of my actions yeah. that I realized, oh, I'm seeing this as orange and everyone else is acting like it is so blue and they're not, it's not colorblind. Um, and I couldn't even see that there was another viewpoint. Then I turned into like, oh, there's a play going on inside my head <laughs> and it's the flavor orange. And it doesn't have that much to do with what's actually happening right now. And unfortunately, it was a few hours after it happened that I began to do this. <laughs> so that I had to make amends. Oh, I, I think we're yeah we're at the end of our time. But one more the line here one more before question. we go. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, very helpful for me to better understand vows. Um, so a comment and then a question. So maybe is it accurate or inaccurate to think of it as um you know sort of just 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 sitting without vows or a lot of concepts you're kind of deconditioning yourself from you know uh, sort of physiological automation that you may kind of have built up over time but then you you, you take a vow and you're kind of simplifying yourself in a ethical realm where things are we live in the world with concepts and with thoughts and you're choosing to kind of um let go of some choices that you may have to make in an instant at a future point in time. And by taking that vow, you've kind of deconditioned yourself. So when the moment is there, um, you're not, you're not choosing. So that is that a useful way to think about it. And two, uh, vows that may be in conflict. Um, I was thinking about a, a vow that someone brought up yesterday, the vow to, um, uh, to be alive, um, uh, or a vow to, and sort of dependent on that, then that, sort of there's a dependency there and about sort of just for self-preservation right so we're all here uh presumably whether we like it or chose it or not we have a vow to ingest food and not cross the road when we're not supposed to uh like a, a vow for self-preservation seems to be there is there can you can you talk a little bit about vows that may in fact be in conflict or seemingly in conflict I'm not sure I understand the question exactly. Um, so, so if I have a vow to, let's say, I have a vow to help others, and that's a, it's not a conditional statement, you know, help others when it's convenient. If I can, you know, it's 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 not a legal document. It's a it's a simple, earnest statement. But then I have a vow for self preservation. Okay, like I'm, I'm you're saying is you're you're speaking a lot about aspiration, something you it would be uh, uh, seems to be appropriate and wholesome to live in a circle Correct. that they come from this. And one of them is to be alive. To well, there's there's to be alive, but then there is just just, you know, if we're talking about vows as things that are already there, you know, there's self preservation. I mean, I think th th that vow is always with us, whether or not we're explicit yeah. about it, because we're, you know, we're choosing to live a life moment by moment that is well, likely to increase the chance <laughs> We're animals, so we have the self-preservation built in. Right. Yeah. We have, it's there. We don't we don't choose it, but it's there. So if yeah. sort of is the, is there is there a sort of something useful to say about a potential conflict or seeming conflict between uh, vows? Like maybe if you gave everything away so that you were starving, then you know, and then you're done. Yeah, because it has to be wholesome, and uh, according to the precepts, which would mean not to kill, not to hurt either you or anybody else it goes both ways so if you're doing something that is 
against your, this is what the Buddha's situation was in the beginning with the seated practice. He said, oh, if you denigrate the body and then you'll be enlightened, he realized, no, it's the middle way. I've got to take care of this and that, because guess what? They're not separate. This is just one thing. So there's, that, that's, that's such a big question. We're gonna to have to follow up. We're gonna to have to stop tonight only because of our time, but that's a, a really an excellent question because it opens up the center of a lot of the Buddhist teaching.